All right, now that we understand how the signal travels through the neuron, we now need to understand what happens when that signal reaches the axon terminal. I mentioned in the very first overview that neurons communicate at synapses, which are the sites of signal transmission. I've also mentioned that the cell sending the signal is referred to as the presynaptic cell, and the cell receiving the signal is the postsynaptic cell. Also, recall that the space between the two neurons is called the synaptic cleft. There are two types of synapses that can be found in the body, chemical and electrical synapses. All the synapses that I've shown for the moment were chemical. To see how these two types of synapses differ from one another, let's first go over electrical synapses. Electrical synapses are found between neurons and between glial cells and are characterized by the fact that there is a cytoplasmic continuity between the pre- and postsynaptic cells. This continuity is facilitated by gap junction channels. One gap junction channel is made out of two connexons that are each embedded in the membrane of the pre- and postsynaptic cell. One connexon is made out of six connexins, hence one gap junction is made out of two connexons or 12 connexins. Connexins are a very diverse group of transmembrane proteins. In the human genome, there are about 21 different types of connexin genes, which allows great diversity in the gap junction channels. The two connexons together form one large non-specific pore that allows current to directly flow through. The big diameter pore also allows metabolic signals such as CAMP, small peptides, as well as inorganic anions and cations like calcium to flow through. Because the cytoplasm is continuous through these gap junctions, signaling in electrical synapses can be bidirectional, but due to the diversity of connexins, some gap junctions only allow to flow unidirectionally. Gap junction channels aren't always open, however. Most gap junction channels can close in response to a low pH, elevated calcium, phosphorylation, or voltage. But that depends obviously on the type of gap junction. Another consequence of the continuous cytoplasm is the fact that there is essentially no delay in terms of the response from the postsynaptic cell after a signal is sent from the presynaptic cell. For example, if an action potential travels through the presynaptic cell, and after passing through the gap junction, the current from the action potential is above the threshold for the postsynaptic cell, then an action potential can be fired from the postsynaptic cell almost instantaneously. A good example of this synchronized firing occurs in the cardiac muscles, which are cells that make up the muscles of the heart. In this very crude diagram of the cardiac muscles, you can see the cardiac muscle cells, which are connected by these purple bands called intercalated discs. These discs contain gap junction channels that allow the flow of current, metabolites, and etc. to flow through. When action potentials travel through these cells, the small delay in rapid transmission of the signal is propagated in the cardiac muscles with synchronicity and produces rhythmic contractions of the heart. In neurons and glial cells, electrical synapses have functions that are less understood, but regardless, you can see that the very rapid transmission that gap channels provide can be very beneficial depending on the need of the body. Now, when it comes to chemical synapses, there is no continuity in cytoplasm between the two cells, and the synaptic cleft is about 5 to 10 times larger than electrical synapses. To establish some useful terminology on chemical synapses that we will use for the rest of the video, let's go over the general process of how chemical synapses work. Everything begins when the action potential reaches the axon terminal, where neurotransmitters are synthesized and packaged into synaptic vesicles. This region in the presynaptic cell, where neurotransmitters reside and are ready to be released, is usually referred to as the active zone. The depolarization carried by the action potential allows to open voltage-gated calcium channels. Because of the steep calcium concentration gradient, when the channels open, calcium rapidly enters the active zone. The entry of calcium causes the fusion of the vesicles with the membrane and the subsequent release of neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. This release of neurotransmitters is also referred to as exocytosis. As neurotransmitters diffuse in the cleft, they bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell, which are located in a region called the postsynaptic density. There are two main types of receptors on which neurotransmitters can bind, ionotropic and metabotropic. Ionotropic receptors are essentially the ligand-gated ion channels that I have introduced when I talked about the general properties of ion channels. When these channels open, 
The ions that the channel is selective to can flow in or out depending on their driving force. As ions enter or leave the cell through these channels, the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell is either depolarized or hyperpolarized. For that reason, these channels provide a rapid and direct path for ionic efflux and influx. The impacts of ionotropic receptors usually last for a brief period, which is usually the time that the membrane readapts to its resting potential. Metabotropic receptors, on the other hand, have more indirect effects in comparison to ionotropic receptors. When they are stimulated, they produce second messengers such as CAMP or diacylglycerol that usually activate protein kinases that have a multitude of different physiological impacts. One such impact is the phosphorylation of other ion channels, which regulates their opening or closing. Because of these indirect effects, metabotropic channels provide amplification and modulation mechanisms through second messengers that can impact the cell for considerably longer periods than ionotropic receptors. Anyhow, this is just a brief introduction. We will get into the fine details later when we will discuss their effects more concretely. You will notice that in this general model of the chemical synapse, the transmission is unidirectional, but we will see later some examples where this blurs out a bit. For the most part, however, you can consider that the signal is unidirectional. Moreover, due to all these steps in signal transmission, chemical synapses have a delay of about 1 millisecond that is very notable in comparison to electrical synapses. Based on what we covered, when we compare the two synapses, you will see that the two are very different and have their respective nuances. As far as this video goes, we will not extensively go back to electrical synapses because they are not as utilized in the body as chemical synapses. And to be quite honest, in this introduction I've covered the bulk of what we know about them. So with this being said, let's get better insight on how our knowledge on chemical synapses came about by considering the synapse between the motor neuron coming out of the spinal cord and the skeletal muscle that it innervates. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.